Good afternoon from uh, Jerusalem. My name is Dr. Nir Bombs. Uh, I'm a member of the WJDDC uh, Corps, the World Jewish Diplomatic Corps, uh, also a professor at uh, Tel Aviv uh, University. It's a pleasure uh, to be here for all those who are joining us on uh, Facebook Live. It's also a pleasure to have uh, Professor Gerald Steinberg uh, with us for a conversation uh, titled The Summer Camp or Boot Camp. Uh, looking at the end uh, of the summer and how uh, hot the summer is perhaps in other places, uh, certainly when it comes to uh, Palestinian summer camps and uh, related issues. We'll speak about that in, in a few minutes. Uh, so, Professor Steinberg, uh, it's very good to have you. I'm happy to be here. A lot of work to be done, a lot of things to talk about before we get into the Do Your Holiday. So, you know, Professor Steinberg, you, uh, uh, you are a man who have, uh, uh, is familiar probably to uh, a, a number of uh, those who have uh, been joining us, but just to, for the sake of some of the formalities, uh, you are the founder and the president of uh, NGO uh, Monitor. Uh, you are a professor of political science uh, at uh, Bar Ilan uh, University. You are also the founder of the program on conflict management and negotiations at Bar Ilan uh, University. Uh, you have done years of uh, research on the changing political dynamics in the Middle East. Uh, a lot of your work also focused on NGOs. We will speak more uh, about that. You are uh, a laureate uh, of the prestigious Begin Award uh, and also uh, of the prestigious uh, Science Award. Uh, you have uh, published extensively, you are being interviewed extensively uh, on issues connected to Middle East policy and certainly to NGOs and the work of the organization that you have started. You're also uh, a physicist, uh, perhaps trying uh, in, in some ways to, to figure out how the world needs to work and if uh, the physics cannot work, we go into the metaphysics and trying to sort all of this out. So can you just perhaps tell us, uh, how did you get to do what you're doing? I think in any life process, there are lots of different strands that come together, not necessarily in a planned way. In fact, I certainly a lot of the work that I do wasn't something that I planned to do, but one thing led to another. And uh, I did begin my academic, my professional life in astrophysics, and uh, it was it's a fa fascinating area. And in some ways, I still regret having left it, but it was a gradual process. We're sitting here in Jerusalem. I've always been a Zionist. It's something that is, if, if not part of my genetic code, it's certainly something that I was brought up with uh, in California, a long way away from Israel, but with a very strong consciousness of the connection uh, between American Jews, between myself as a Jew, a second generation, a first generation after the, the Holocaust. Israel was the, the real core of so many different values and so much that was important. And uh, I came to Israel on a regular basis. I spent time here. I made Aliyah. In, after I finished my doctorate in 1982, so I've been here for 36 years, it's a long time. And um, there are issues, especially in those days, there are issues that are very central to Israel. I, for a number of years, I did, as you may recall, back in the old days, I did a lot of work on nuclear non-proliferation or nuclear proliferation and how to prevent it. Uh, early on working on issues like uh, the, Iraq, the Iraqi nuclear program, which has largely been forgotten, but that was a big trigger to all of the conflict that has taken place. Uh, and then uh, afterwards working on the Iranian nuclear program and, and in the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency as a, an Israeli uh, representative in various frameworks trying to deal with those issues. So the idea of trying to deal with problems that are threatening Israel, that affect Israel, and th that was my hard power part of my life. I saw in that process that perhaps equally or more threatening to Israel was what we now call delegitimization or demonization. We didn't use that language then. Uh, in political science people talk about soft power. And I began to see without knowing, the, not using the language in those days, the soft power. The attacks on Israel which were made under the headline facade of human rights, international law. Uh, in the 90s, these were increasing, increasingly problematic, uh, and that eventually led me into the work that you and I have been working together on for now it's been 16, 17 years. The Durban Conference of 2001, which was actually where the two issues kind of met for a little while, and I took on more of this same type of analysis, this rational analysis of trying to understand what's the threat, how do we deal with that, what are the strategic options, and then what are the tactics that evolve from that. 
in terms of the delegitimization, the demonization, and that's been the, the focus of my, my work. I see them as a, a continuous uh, flow, but it's hard to see the pieces, how they fit together if you don't see each step along the way. So we'll get back to some of these favorite letters, B, D, uh, and S, in just a few minutes. But let's get uh, to, again, the end of the summer and to uh, the title that was associated with this discussion, uh, Summer Camp or Boot Camp. Uh, we have just, uh, in the end uh, of the summer, we have seen summer camps uh, here uh, in Israel. Uh, uh, many parents had a sign of relief uh, when they were able to send their kids to summer camps. And it seems that Palestinians are doing the same. Can you tell us something uh, about... Uh, perhaps some of the differences or some of the issues of why uh, we are titling summer camp or a boot camp. What is happening on the other side? We tend to, uh, people who look from the outside, tend to mi what we call mirror image. We look and we expect that Palestinians are like Israelis, Palestinian parents are like Israeli parents, Palestinian children are like Israeli children. And, and that's often a, a problem in a lot of international politics, certainly in dealing with the conflict in here where we are and throughout the Middle East. It's very different and I think the title is a good one to focus on those differences. Because throughout the year, throughout their lives, Palestinian children, particularly in Gaza, I think we should make a distinction between the Palestinians, 1.5 plus minus million Palestinians who live in Gaza that live, live in what is really a closed dictatorial regime. It's run by a terrorist organization, by Hamas, and there it's really 24-7 indoctrination, preparation for armed conflict, the armed struggle that uh, Palestinians hear constantly, certainly in Gaza, from their parents, from their teachers, from the, uh, the leaders of, of Hamas, in the mosques, in all parts of society. And their summer camps, the term boot camp is very appropriate. Where they are trained, and we see these in films all the time, we don't, Israelis don't go into Gaza. If we did, we'd be killed, we'd be kidnapped. Very few foreigners actually go into Gaza. What you Westerners go into Gaza, it's very rare. And the, um, the ability to understand to um, see what happens on the ground is difficult, but we do have all the, uh, the social media activities, all the, all the uh, evidence of what goes on in there. It's constant indoctrination. You see these little kids carrying rifles, carrying machine guns, uh, dressed as if they were uh, um, terrorists, martyrs is the language, the jihad. All of those things that we, we associate with that process are very visible in the summer. And uh, in fact, so the, I'm not even sure that a Palestinian child, the age of five, six, seven, eight, sees much of a difference between what they do in the summer and what they do throughout the year. Maybe the buildings are different, maybe the framework is somewhat different, but the messaging of, of hate, of uh, being prepared to be part of this, this conflict, to sacrifice one's life, all of those things are deeply embedded in this process. For those of us who've joined uh, now, uh, my name is Nir Baum, I'm a member of the World the Jewish Diplomatic Corps, and we are here in a conversation with uh, Professor Gerald Steinberg, the founder of NGO Monitor, a professor at uh, Bar Ilan uh, University. Uh, we're speaking about summer camp or boot camp, beginning a conversation uh, about uh, uh, Palestinian uh, incitement, um, and soon speaking about issues of uh, uh, BDS and the work of NGOs. And, you know, we just spoke about uh, uh, this sort of summer experience. Uh, I mean, uh, one question that comes to mind is uh, if these things are visible for so long, uh, if uh, we have a whole plethora of uh, states, organizations, NGOs, uh, the same groups that you study, that are so involved in this work, uh, trying to promote the objective of peace, is there any way that they will make a difference? Is there any progress that you see? Is this another summer of lack of hope? I wouldn't say lack of hope, but I would say lack of progress. Each, whether it's a summer, each year, each decade, is more or less the same. I think we should connect this a little bit with the controversy uh, in the United States or around the world. The U.S. government just announced a couple of days ago that they are ceasing funding for the United Nations Refugee and Works Agency, UNRWA. UNRWA runs the schools in 
most of the Palestinian schools, in, in both in Gaza and the West Bank, also in Jerusalem, by the way, and uh, they run, provide a lot of services. They're a, basically a substitute for Palestinian government in everything but terror and violence. And UNRWA sets the tone. They use exactly the same textbooks as uh, Hamas authorizes or as the Palestinian Authority authorizes. They claim to substitute a little bit of their own material, but if you look at that material, you don't really expect that much of that's actually being taught by the teachers. We've had many instances of teachers on Facebook, on social media, that express really crude anti-Semitism, that express uh, absolute hostility in, in the most starkest terms towards Israel. These are the teachers. It's a very pessimistic image. And so UNRWA, the United Nations, to some degree also with UNICEF, unfortunately, in this region. We can talk about that a little bit later. And then after that, we have humanitarian aid agencies. I, maybe if, if we were sitting here in, a, in a, a university setting, I could go and talk about some of the very subtle differences. But in, in a broad stroke, you have a, a massive um, NGO involvement in all facets of this. We have groups like um, Oxfam, you have groups like World Vision that provide and get, in many cases, money from governments to provide the services. Some of that money, in the case of World Vision, gets siphoned off. Half of the money that people donated, or the Australian government donated to uh, World Vision for the West Bank and Gaza, was siphoned off into Hamas military terrorist capabilities. The trial is ongoing of the head of the uh, World Vision operation in Gaza, who was responsible for uh, diverting is a polite term, stealing, moving from humanitarian needs to building terror tunnels and similar things. I'm giving you a pessimistic image because I think, I wouldn't say it's pessimistic looking towards the future, it's a realistic image that these institutions, which have not been looked at with much of a microscope, are continuing and responsible for maintaining the conflict. Well, we will try to look for some optimism uh, soon, but let's perhaps pr offer some context for, for what you've said. Sometimes when I'm being asked to try to explain Israel, I'll say, well, let's begin. It's a small country that makes a lot of noise. And it seems that, uh, from what you're saying, uh, there's obviously a lot of focus in Israel. There's a magnifying glass here, and I think there is an unparalleled number of organizations and NGOs that are here to, in a way, make a difference. Whether they're making or not, it's a different story and what kind of a difference. But can you just give a context of numbers? How many organizations are operating here? Can you try to quantify it in, in, in some ways, whether it's by numbers or by uh, donations and money? Rough number is, I'd say, between 180 and 200 organizations that have a significant, that's also one of those terms you would have to define what they are, but these are organiza the organization, the, the framework, the NGO that you mentioned that I founded, that I run, NGO Monitor. We monitor about 180 organizations. Those are the ones that are the most active. There are probably a few that we look at in a relatively minor way because they are not involved in the political advocacy. They're not involved in some of the uh, incitement. But most of them are. That is, that's a very... It's a large number. Now, there are actually there are tens of thousands of organizations that have um, formal claims to be working in the area, but most of them have very limited uh, involvement. And sometimes, you, very often, you'll have one or two people set up a little placard somewhere on a website and be an NGO and make a little bit of money on the side. But 200 organizations, we're still dealing with a very small area, elbowing for some sort of role and using it also to raise money. Look at the things that we're doing to help the Palestinians, to maintain the Palestinian, um, well, I would call it victimhood, but there's an agency in the United Nations, the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, a committee for the preservation of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. And you'll see at their meetings, at their conferences, many of these NGOs will be participating. That's really what they do. So they preserve close the Palestinian to narrative. So close to 200 organizations operating in a the political sphere trying to influence. Um, how much money are we talking about? 
That's a tougher question. Uh, we, and, and it's also, I, I think we have to break down the money a little bit. Uh, we're putting together NGOs that promote more the human rights narrative, NGOs that claim to be promoting democracy, NGOs that promote economic development, NGOs that promote humanitarian aid. We're talking about overall budgets of perhaps $200 million a year. That's only for NGOs. That does not include all the much larger amounts that go to aid to the Palestinians directly or to through the UN agencies. So that's a significant amount of money. Can you give perhaps some examples of what these $200 million buy or do in, let's say, the West Bank and Gaza? There's a combination. I'm not going to say, and I think it would be wrong to, to claim that they don't do anything humanitarian or economically significant. And so you have groups that, on the one hand, will provide equipment and will provide training and will provide services, let's say, for farmers. Farmers in the West Bank, farmers in Gaza. Or for um, education, obviously that's an important area. Medical assistance, running clinics, opening, uh, working within hospitals. So those are the positive elements. The problem is that in many cases, 50% is a very round number, but in many cases, 25, 30, 40, at least up to 50, and perhaps sometimes more, of the money that people governments expect to be spent on these positive elements are siphoned off. It's very hard to work in Gaza, which is where a lot of the money goes, and not be subject to Hamas taking off and using, it, it's a form of a tax, it could be 50 more percent. If you look at the tunnels, when we've seen those tunnels, those very um, engineeringly developed concrete structures that go for kilometers underground, it takes, where does that concrete come from? It's siphoned off the humanitarian aid. The NGOs, we did a study, NGO Monitor did a study. We presented it to the United Nations. They weren't thrilled in 20, 2015 of the main humanitarian aid organizations working in Gaza. And our question was, to what degree do these organizations monitor? Do they do what, what in the language of uh, management is called due diligence? To what degree do they try to prevent, do they act to prevent the stealing, the use of, of building materials by terrorist organizations. And the, there's almost very, I would say almost nothing, very little attention paid. They, Palestinians are victims and we have to help the, power the victims and we have to operate in these areas and we can't determine who does what with the materials that we bring. That's a, more or less a summary of how this is, is done. So if it's 200 million, and again, we're talking only about the NGO funding, and 100 million of that gets siphoned off, that's, that's serious money. For those who uh, joined us, uh, we are in conversation in uh, Facebook Live with Professor Gerald Steinberg, the founder of uh, NGO Monitor, a professor at bar -Ilan University. Uh, let's perhaps uh, move to the slightly more optimistic side of it. The organizations, many of them are funded. There are non-government organizations, but many of them are funded by governments. Uh, and some of these governments are governments who are genuinely interested in things opposite, perhaps, to what they fund. And it is my understanding that part of your work uh, actually helps them understand that and actually is able to change uh, some uh, of their funding criteria and then some of their funding itself. So can you tell us a little bit about how that process, first of all, what is the involvement of foreign governments in all of these NGOs? Are they the main uh, uh, player? And uh, what is your experience of trying to work with these governments? Uh, and uh, can you tell us something about uh, some perhaps successes in this area? I, we talked about approximately $200 million a year going into these, through these organizations. When I started doing the research on this 15, 16 years ago, I was surprised to learn that about half comes from governments because, as you pointed out, they're called non-governmental organizations, but a very large part of their budget comes from governments. So what does that mean? Governments in Europe in particular provide their international aid, which is quite substantial. It's an important part of the Western European 
uh, political perspective uh, and um, priorities, so particularly if you go to Scandinavia and other countries where they talk about how, what percentage of their budget should go to help the needy and the poor around the world. Well, we're with that. somehow the Palestinians tend to be always at the very top, no matter what disasters take place. We can talk about that later, why that is. But since 2011, there have been millions of Syrian refugees. Palestinian gets by far the top level of, of aid and assistance. This is 68 years after UNRWA was founded. So this is a very powerful, I would call it a lobby, uh, providing aid and governments in Europe Western European governments, from the north, from Finland down to Spain, provide millions, some 10, sometimes 15 million a year, depending on which government. Most of the international aid given by Western European governments goes through a second non-governmental framework. The government gives money to Christian aid in the United Kingdom, it gives money to uh, a uh, ecumenical uh, framework, a uh, Christian ecumen ecumenical organization, ICO, in Holland. They give them budgets of hundreds of millions of euros or pounds. Or when you get to those numbers, the, the currency, you're talking about large amounts of money. The governments say, we are going to, we are better at doing this than we are. We're governments, we don't have, we don't have the skills. You are humanitarian aid organizations. But then, within that framework, they don't pay attention to how the money is distributed. Our job, and this gets back to your question, I have to put the background in there, but the job of NGO Monitor, and, and it's a job that we set up for ourselves because we realized the governments weren't doing it, is to say, hey, this is where your money is going. Your money, I'll give you an example. I mentioned ICO in Holland. Again, this is, this is a very massive, by any standards, uh, aid organization. Or we could talk about a parallel one in Germany, a Catholic group, a Protestant group, Brot for die Welt. They're all very similar from an outsider's perspective. That they have Palestinian Palestine desks, and those Palestine desks determine where the money goes, how it's being used, which individuals and organizations get to have it, and of course that gives them a lot of power in their own communities. The governments pay no attention. ICO in Holland turned out to be one of the main funders of electronic intifada. Now, supposedly, they're supposed to be using this money for humanitarian aid. Electronic intifada is one of the most virulent anti-Israel uh, website social media frameworks. And it's not really like electronic peace. It's the opposite thereof, as the uh, term intifada suggests. The good Which news is, an uprising. and we see a very violent uprising in our context anyway. The good news is that what we've seen over the last um, couple of years is that although the governments don't like to get our reports and they don't want to find out really that their money is being abused, nobody likes to find that out, but when it hits the newspapers, they would rather have it dealt with directly before it becomes used against them in their own countries, in their own parliaments, for instance. So the good news is that we've seen an increase in the due diligence. And some of the most outrageous examples of funding are the ones that, that we've seen it in Switzerland, Sweden, Holland, Denmark, to some degree in the UK, more slowly, but a few examples in Germany, Spain. Each country, as it gets reports from us, and then it gets into their newspapers and their parliaments, and they have debates, there are changes that we begin to see. So I, I am cautiously optimistic that perhaps, to go back to our, the first uh, discussion that we had about the summer boot camps, which are very much part of the system, that perhaps in next year or the year after there will be more, we call it adult supervision, that the money won't be handed out blindly, but will be provided for legitimate activities and not for ones which promote terrorism and incitement. And your organization was so far responsible for defunding uh, of about $24 million uh, from these budgets uh, going to organizations that rather than uh, promote peace, they promote the exact opposite agenda. Uh, and you spoke about a number of countries in where this is applicable to, and I know that you have recently made some headlines in uh, Europe 
uh, particularly in uh, Sweden. Yes, when indeed. you and Trump uh, were candidates for getting some sort of uh, non-award, I would say. Well, it was actually quite interesting. That was the we know we're, we're successful when the frameworks that we are trying to criticize and trying to make public attack us and avoid completely the substance. That means that they don't really have a defense. And in Sweden, the international the the international cooperation and aid uh, agency, the Swedish one is called SIDA, makes sense, starts with an S, and they fund a magazine, an online magazine, which devoted, I don't think you even, last time we met it wasn't, 20 articles, one after the other, it was, we saw it to 13, 14, now up to 20. And the top article, the first article, and this theme is repeated, is a spider web. This is how the Israeli right-wing anti-Palestinian conspiracy has maneuvered the Swedish government into cutting funds to these wonderful organizations. So we're in the, I'm in the center of this conspiracy. There are anti-Semitic overtones to that. We've started a process, uh, I wouldn't call it yet a dialogue, but some discussion with the Swedish government on uh, the uh, virulence of these attacks. And this your aid agency, I have to say that the response, the first response of the aid agency heads was, well, we provide the funding, but they have um, freedom of speech, and we do not control the content, to which our response is that when there is incitement, uh, when you have anti-Semitism, it's the people who provide the money that are responsible to make sure that this doesn't happen. It's the, they own they are the legal owners of this magazine, so therefore they are responsible. It's an interesting co process which I think will strengthen, will deepen the, uh, the view in Sweden that they really have to get control over where this money goes. So perhaps we can grant you the Webmaster Award, at least in the uh, Swedish context. Um, let's uh, speak about another favorite uh, subject, uh, the letters, the three letters I mentioned before, BDS, the boycott and the investment and sanctions movement. Uh, we have been hearing certainly in the last decade or really as you've said after the Durban uh, conference uh, 17 years ago, uh, more about this term. Can you give us a, a sort of a broader context uh, about the, how the BDS movement fits into this uh, uh, dynamic that we've been describing into the work of the uh, NGOs and into the broader discourse around Israel, particularly when it comes to Europe? I'll be the professor for two minutes, the political scientist. Before I do BDS, I'm going to do soft power because we know what hard power is. That's military to military, tanks, aircraft. Soft power is destroying one's reputation. It can also be used positively, but in this case we're talking about using soft power political warfare to attack the, the, the name, the image, the perception of Israel as a country and of Israelis as a people. If on a university campus or when on university campuses there is a discussion about whether to boycott Israel, the B is for boycotts, and in dozens of campuses around the world we have every year we don't, but we, we see uh, introduction of uh, and submission of resolutions and student councils to boycott Israel. And sometimes myself and my colleagues are boycotted. Uh, there are many instances where articles are submitted to journals and a faculty member will say, I'm boycotting Israel, you people are all war criminals. That's a summary of, of the basic uh, claims that are made, the justification for boycotting Israel. The goal is to make Israel well, the language of Durban was the complete international isolation of Israel as an apartheid state. This language was adopted by 1,500 NGOs in a stadium in Durban, South Africa, which was in a conference that was held to commemorate the end of apartheid. And it was hijacked. And we can, at a different, maybe in a different context, talk about why that was allowed to happen and who was uh, not paying attention and how this process took place. But that was the beginning of BDS. I think it's also important to recognize the D is for divestment. Those are mainly the church-based operations, sometimes also pension funds. It's an economic term. 
but it's a form of boycott, and sanctions, uh, including efforts to prevent Israel from purchasing technology for its uh, defense and things like that. That framework was used in the 1970s, 80s against South Africa, against the apartheid regime in South Africa. I have to say from a public relations point of view, from an advertising point of view, it was very clever to take that package and from the South African case and apply it to Israel. That's what's being used and again it's primarily the economic boycott has been a complete failure. Uh, Soda Stream was sold for how much? How many billions the other day? An Israeli firm, not to mention all the other uh, high-tech firms. But in terms of the image of Israel in academic places or cancellation of uh, concerts, there's a wide range of activities that take place where BDS is, is a, a very harsh form of, of soft power warfare. But one of the interesting paradoxes of this phenomena is that on one hand you can argue that Israel today is doing very well when it comes to diplomatic and political circles. It has relations with many more countries in the world. It is, you know, the Prime Minister is one of the very few who is able to speak uh, with President Trump and President Putin almost in the same intensity uh, and, and proximity. Uh, you had growing relationships even in the heart of uh, the Arab and the Muslim world. And at the same token, you know, we speak about uh, this issues of perceptions, cancellations of concert. What is the bigger picture here in the context of the BDS? Are they winning? Are they losing? How should we look at it if you try to give it a, a sense of a perspective? BDS, to the degree that it's successful in poisoning the image of Israelis, is successful with millennials, people, let's say, uh, uh, around the age of 20, 25, um, vulnerable to um, fake news in the sense that the, if they get all of their news from uh, Al Jazeera, not just from Al Jazeera, but it filtrates all the way through. In other words, if they see Israel as the, a leper country, you know, a country that needs to be isolated, that violates all the norms of international uh, human rights and, and proper behavior, that's going to hurt us in the long term. And that's, I see that in some of my students. They'll come back from their summer vacations, and they'll are a year abroad, in Britain in particular, and it's not coincidental, this is associated now with the whole um, exposure of anti-Semitism in the British Labor Party led by uh, Jeremy Corbyn. You're a Jew, you're in, well, they, the conversation, I've heard this from a number of my students, you're an Israeli, you served in the army, you're a war criminal, you, cannot, you can't be my friend, I don't want you to be in, in my framework at all, I don't want you to be in my classes. Um, that kind of personal attack, it doesn't hurt economically, it hurts on a personal basis. And, and I won't say that the BDS is winning. We are sensitive in Israel every time that there is some sort of successful boycott move. I think we're oversensitive but it's also not over at all. I think the level of BDS attacks in uh, on American university campuses, from the statistics that we've seen that are out there, is slowly diminishing. And I will say part of the reason is that they're getting less money from European NGOs because the money is being cut, partly because it's become an important issue for the Israeli government to confront the European funders of these things. Uh, not always successfully, but that's part of the package. So uh, it's the, the fight is ongoing. Are we winning or losing? I think that the, it, it's like in any other kind of a war, when you're in the middle of the war, it could go many different directions. But the, there's a good fight going on. It's not at the, the um, balance of power, let's say, the ups and the downs, is more favorable to Israel, less favorable to BDS overall than it was three or four years ago. Well, I assume that some of those who join us uh, this uh, uh, podcast, uh, Facebook Live, uh, Professor Steinberg, are those interested in the issue, and they're also asking themselves, okay, so if I'm there somewhere in the world, and I'd like to be a part of this fight, I feel this is the right fight, what can I do? There are different levels, and everybody, we, we spend a lot of time on that issue. Uh, I'll give you an example, and... Uh, it, it can be applied in many different ways. 
I speak to a lot of medical professionals. For a number of years, there was a very strong campaign in British medical journals to attack Israel. The Lancet and the British BMJ, the British Medical Journal, and it, it had influences. There were at every, almost every, many, many of these annual conferences that take place, including then it spread to the United States, the American Public Health Association, many examples of that, where is, and Israeli medical professionals, doctors, researchers are among the top in the world, and they found themselves always in fights, being isolated, being um, labeled with some very nasty language, being told that they can't participate because they're Israelis, that kind of language. First of all, there was a good pushback. What we say to the doctors that we meet with, they travel up before they, they go to conference, they go to um, do a fellowship somewhere. First of all, to learn the details, to learn to be prepared. In the military, we start with an intelligence briefing. What's out there? You don't, it doesn't require more than a couple of hours. To be prepared so you know what to do. Don't be surprised. And then you can, depending on the situation, what are the techniques that exist to fight back? And there are, there are, there are some very good ones. Some, sometimes it's useful to fight on terms of the substance. No, Israel's not an apartheid state. Most people who use that language, uh, there's the diehards who will never be convinced. But then there are a lot of others who have been brought into this and, and thought, think they know and they think that they're being righteous. And you tell them that you know, Israeli Arabs, minorities, are elected to the Israeli parliament, approximately in the portion of the population. They go to Israeli universities. There are many pa Palestinian Israeli Arabs who work in Israeli hospitals, etc. Well, that's not really apartheid, is it then? So challenging, knowing what are the points to challenge is another way to deal with it. Another way to deal with it is to volunteer for organizations. People who, again, it's a matter of talents, but uh, or to be part of the World Jewish Congress and the activities, and we have been to many different uh, uh, conferences, and, and we did it together, NGO Monitor and the World Jewish Congress did a, uh, a conference in Tel Aviv about maybe six months ago on anti-Semitism. It was um, in memory of Professor Robert Ristrich, who was very much involved with the World Jewish Congress and with NGO Monitor on these issues. So there are different ways that one can be part of this environment and uh, can go off and, and contribute. Cameras are just one of them. Stand with us. There's so many organizations that, for instance, letter writing. It's probably a little bit old-fashioned, but uh, getting involved in some of the, if the Facebook and Twitter wars is also part of it. So everybody can find the niche that they're comfortable. I think there's a lot that can be done. Mr. Steinberg, we're doing this just days before uh, the end of the Jewish year, before the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, this is certainly a time when we can begin to think and introspect. Uh, if you're looking at uh, the year that just passed, and if you're looking at the year ahead, something about uh, the most significant challenge that you faced, and perhaps the most interesting opportunity that you see? Challenges, I'd say, are pretty much continuous. We, this year, we start with the security issues, and then around every, every time there's a clash, then the allegations of Israel using disproportionate force, deliberately killing children, all of those things come back to force. And I think the biggest challenge for us this year was the allegation, or the allegations were the allegations that Israel mistreats Palestinian children, that Israel uses, uh, we often hear the claim Israel, Israeli soldiers deliberately kill Palestinian children. There's an organization whose entire, an NGO, whose entire focus, entire purpose uh, is to promote this, it really is a, a, a classic fake news, a lie. It's called Defense for Children, wonderful name, Defense for Children International hyphen Palestine. And many of the battles, I would say, on the soft power war field, battlefield, that NGO Monitor fought this year that I was involved in, relate to these efforts. They spoke in the Australian Parliament and presented this image of Israel as being child killers. They spoke in the uh, American Congress, in a, uh, um, it wasn't in the Congress itself, it was outside, but on Capitol Hill. And um, they got 35 members of Congress, 
to um, add their names to a bill or a proposed bill. Now that's less than 10 percent. It won't go anywhere, at least not in this session. But to penalize Israel on the grounds they took the language of this Palestinian group called Defense of Children International Palestine, an organization which, by the way, has whose leaders have very close ties to a terrorist organization, the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. But they've become now part of the human rights movement. Well, how do you fight against that? How do you say, no, these are lies? And if you engage in a discussion about that, people remember Israel torturing children. They don't remember the facts where you say, well, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is invented, this is fake. So that's been a very... Uh, difficult challenge for us or an important challenge for us and uh, I, I think we were at least able to contain that that um, the spread of those allegations that's also a partial success you asked about successes I, I think a very important part of the success is that some of their money was cut off by there were four countries in a consortium I won't get into it but they they had funneled money about five or six million dollars a year, which was slightly different, through Birzeit University, through a framework that had the words the international law and human, international hum, humanitarian law and human rights secretariat. Governments gave the money to this organization, Palestinian organ, and the Palestinians sent it out to all their friends. DCIP was one of the major recipients. That money has been stopped. So. We made the case into the, before those governments, and they, they have now undertaken reviews, and in the meantime, they've frozen the funding. So that is, it's not a direct defeat of BDS in terms of the language that's used, but if you have, in a war, if you have less bullets, if you have less fuel for your tanks and your aircraft, you're going to be able to do less attacks. Well, if you have less money to send speakers, to do films, to do viral uh, video posts on YouTube attacking Israel, you're going to have less ability to promote this kind of um, poisonous campaign. And if you were to end uh, and with some wishes uh, for uh, the year that's coming, what would they be? Look, there's a personal element, and I think we always have to do that for the Jewish people, for Israel, for everybody. That We always talk about a, a year of health and um, year of peace. We can, I think it's important to always hope and look, have a vision of where that's going to go. I spend a lot of my time on what we've been discussing for the last uh, number of minutes is a micro view. We're looking at the battlefield where allegations and responses and attempts to poison the image of Israel and BDS and all of those things. How do we push back against that? And the, we started off with the boot camp, the summer camp, the training of Palestinian children, five, six, seven years old, to be martyrs, to be terrorists. At some point that has to end. At some point it's going to change. But we look at the micro picture. We have to continue to do what we're doing to push towards that, that um, change, that macro change. You contain the poisonous attacks, the incitement. You contain the misuse of funding, which is supposed to be for humanitarian uh, goals and is uh, siphoned off into terror tunnels or to propaganda campaigns. Uh, and this is going to, we know that uh, looking forward to next year, we're going to continue some of the aspects of this, but there will be more challenges. I'll just uh, say that people who are sitting outside of Israel may not be aware of the fact that Israel won this year the Europe Eurovision Song Contest. That's a big deal in some ways. Certainly within Europe it's a very big deal. That's a success for Israel, that's a defeat for BDS, but that means next year the Song Festival is supposed to be held in Israel in May. And we can be absolutely sure that when around that time, they'll be building it up for months, there'll be all sorts of efforts to boycott, to tell people not to come, not to watch, to cancel this. There'll be, there may be terror attacks to, to try to force Israel to use force so that they can have the images of, of Israelis. They'll use the language, Israelis kill innocent Palestinians. They'll bring in the children issue again. 
And we know that's a challenge we'll have to face for next year. So you always have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. I'll, I'll settle for that. Well, we will certainly hope uh, for the best. And with this, uh, I would thank Professor Steinberg for really joining us. Uh, thank you for all of those uh, who have joined us uh, on uh, Facebook Live. Uh, and, uh, and thank Neil Bombs for engaging me in a very, uh, I think, very, for me, interesting and enlightening conversation. Good questions. And I hope that uh, the hopes that we had uh, that uh, next time we'll meet, we'll be able to uh, speak more about the bright side of things. Uh, there are other examples, there are other partners, there are other people who are actually doing some work to actually promote peace and promote understanding. And I think it's important to end a little bit with that. Well, sometimes we spend some time looking at the challenges. It's important to remember that there are other people who also work on the opportunities and it's very important uh, to uh, focus on that as well in order to make sure that uh, the very premise that created this country, the anthem of hope, uh, is not uh, going to be forgotten. And certainly when we are ending a year and beginning a new one. So thank you uh, again, Professor Steinberg, very much. Uh, and thank you to World Jewish Congress. Uh, and I wish everyone uh, Shana Tovah and a Happy New Year.